um, you know, just a, a way to kind of uh, ride the wave of the reality that is coronavirus and social distancing and, and, um, and our situation right now. So um, I'm Andrea Merriam with PMD Alliance. Um, we're so excited to bring you this presentation as part of our special series um, uh, about social distancing and, and resilience while you're stuck at home. Um, I want to introduce our neurologist host, Dr. Subramanian, um, and then I'll let you go ahead and, uh, and, and get things started. So take it away, Dr. Subramanian. Okay, well, I hope everyone's still staying safe and um, in their homes and generally doing well. I know it's a very stressful time and that's why we've been trying to put together some offerings here um, in virtual support group land um, to try to help you with uh, keeping active, keeping positive, and trying to understand how to cope um, in these uh, stressful times away from your families, sometimes away from your doctors. And so we're trying to figure out the best way to take care of you as our Parkinson's community, patients, caregivers. I think there's even been some healthcare providers who've been joining us off and on um, and uh, you know, ride through these times. So um, through the wonders of social media um, in some ways, I'm not the queen of social media at all, um, but I ended up finding um, some amazing uh, whiteboard psychology uh, presentations on Facebook um, that had been forwarded from a psychiatrist uh, who's actually going to be on later in this series. Sahib Khalsa will be joining us in, I think, a couple weeks um, to talk about the same issues. But um, he had forwarded this beautiful presentation about anxiety in uh, the COVID era. And I was so fascinated by looking at these whiteboards and um, really drawn to them. And so I ended up um, messaging the person who had posted them. And we're lucky enough to have her here today. Um, she's shared a number of other presentations um, with uh, me and um, has been giving some for her group. Um, she's out on the East Coast where they're seeing a number of these patients right now. And she's an amazing psychologist. Um, I haven't had the pleasure of meeting her uh, yet in person, but we've been connecting through uh, social media and the phone. And so she's gonna bring us um, some uh, some whiteboard psychology presentations that she's been doing for some groups that she's been having uh, out on the East Coast uh, and connecting with her. She's a, um, a psychologist who actually did her internship um, at the VA um, in Philadelphia, which is um, a sister site to our VA. Uh, for any of our veterans out there, um, you know, we have a number of uh, centers of excellence in the country uh, and Philadelphia is one of the flagship sites um, on that coast. And so she spent some time working with our vets and is now in a in more of a private practice setting um, in a in a medical group, um, and has been trying to help her patients um, with giving sound advice in these um, stressful times. So, I will introduce you to her and have her take over now. Um, and uh, we'll have some slides, so hopefully you guys can see these. And I've just been so drawn to these slides that I want to find a way. If anyone in in the world of um, virtual uh, for support group land is um, connected with a publisher that might be interested. I, I would love to write a book with her. That would be an amazing dream. Apart from learning the base, I'm trying to find other things to help our patients um, and the world at large. So, um, so yeah, we'll, we'll see how this goes. Thank you. And thanks again to PMD Alliance for hosting. Well, thanks for having me here. I'm really excited to be here with you all. And that is one little silver lining of this very dark time that we're in is that it's putting us unexpectedly in contact with people that we never would have met otherwise. Um, and coming together in new ways. Thank you. And you just tell me when to launch your slide yeah. um, or if you guys want to chat first. And No, I think we'll, we'll launch right into the slides if that's okay. So, Because I think there's a lot of rich information here and a few slides that I had had her put together from a number of different things. And so maybe we'll go through the information and we'll try to find some points to discuss as well. Yeah, so do you want me to just kind of dive in? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, so, you know, we're, we're going through a hard time collectively to state it, uh, really understate things. And anytime we're coping with hardship, when we talk about coping, there's a couple different ways we can use that word. And um, so I just wanted to kind of set the stage a little bit with you all first. And so one way we can cope with a problem that we have is to do something about the problem itself. So, you know, we've 
been hearing a lot about social distancing and social distancing and all the health guidelines that we're supposed to be following. Um, you know, you make preparations for life at home, and those are all concrete things you can do. But you know, in the face of this pandemic, there's a lot that's outside of our control, and there's a lot of things that we can't actually do about the problem. And that can make us feel very overwhelmed and helpless and powerless. And so my goal for uh, all of you today is to help kind of redirect you towards emotion-focused coping, which is basically saying that no matter what the problem is, no matter how bad it is, no matter how little control you have over the problem itself, there's always things that you can do to cope with it as best as you can and to do everything you can to make it through to the other side um, safely and in uh, the best mental health possible. So everything we talk about today is going to be true regardless of how bad things are in the newspaper. Um, these are all tools that you can fall back on. Um, so should we hop over to the next? Um, and so the first thing, well, we start with real basics here because when we're stuck at home, um, some of the basic things that kind of form the, the structure, the fabric of our lives just kind of falls apart when we're no longer going out to the store, we're no longer going out to our doctor's appointments or at work or school or anything else that makes up our lives. And so it's very easy for that, when that all falls away, for us kind of to fall out of having a routine and having any kind of structure in our day. Um, and that's a problem because we need structure. We need some kind of framework to make us feel just more in control of our lives. And when we have that structure, life feels more predictable and manageable, and it really brings our anxiety level down, um, and it helps protect us from depression. So uh, when you're creating that kind of structure, it can seem kind of daunting to, to plug a lot of things into your day at home if nobody's creating that for you. But So we're starting with the real basics, and I'm talking about when you wake up in the morning, brushing your teeth and getting dressed, just that first step, which um, even that is really challenging when, you know, there's nowhere to go and nowhere to, nowhere to be, no one to see us, except when we're on Zoom. Um, so just the act of getting dressed is that way to signal the start of our day um, and, and just puts us in a much better frame of mind. And then the, the second piece of a structure in your day would be regular meals which again can easily fall away when we're home and the kitchen is right there and we can just kind of graze or maybe we're watching TV for hours and then we don't even notice the time going by and we don't even think to make ourselves a meal. So kind of plugging that in too um, is, an, is an important piece. And then the other piece of some kind of structure in your day is some activity, and we'll get into to more with these things, but the, the basic core um, activities is you wanna think about something that's social something that's, um, if you can get outside or get some sunlight through the window or anything that's connected to nature, um, something that's physical, some kind of physical movement, um, and any kind of productive activity, as simple as doing a load of laundry or washing your dishes. Um, anything that just gives you that feeling like you've gotten something done. And then having some kind of end to our day and preferably having a, a good consistent bedtime. Even if we could stay up as late as we want because there's nowhere to be the next day, well, we wanna have a good um, regular awake time and, and bedtime. Um, so I don't know if you want me to keep going or if you wanna jump in. Um, so, uh, so like I said with, uh, if we can kind of go to, yeah, sleep. Um, so, you know, again, like I was saying, there's nothing necessarily making us wake up at a certain time or making us go to bed, but um, even without that external framework, we, our bodies need that, our brains need that because our bodies work on a 24 hour clock. That's your circadian rhythm, if you've heard that term before. And the, um, the best analogy I've heard for your circadian rhythm, because there's all kinds of changes that go on in your body in that 24 hour cycle. So you've got your sleep cycle, your body temperature is going up and down, different hormones are being released. And so in order for your body to function effectively, you want it to be like an orchestra where the conductor is doing their job and all the instruments are on the same page. And when that happens, you're gonna feel your best. Um, but when the instruments are all on a different page of music, they're all kind of doing their thing at a different pace, then you don't hear music. You hear just a cacophony of noise. And that's what happens to us when our sleep is on uh, a really different, irregular kind of track. Uh, we lose that regular 24-hour rhythm that we need. 
So um, again, even if we don't have something forcing us, we want to just be really deliberate about what time we're getting up and what, what time we're going to bed. Um, feel free to stop me. Yeah, and that's all the more reason in Parkinson's patients because many of our patients are on um, medications that are around specific times and eating as well. So we space our meds away from meals sometimes and um, time them around the wakeful hours. So it's really important for our patients to stay on track with that. Next slide. All right, moving exercise. So, and this is one of these things that nobody needs to be told that it's good for you because we all know that. We know it's one of the best things we could do for our bodies and also for our mood, for our stress level, for protecting against depression, um, for reducing our anxiety. Um, and so it's, it's basic, but it's also a question of getting ourselves to do it, motivating ourselves when we don't have that outside push, when there's not um, the impetus, again, to, to get out and go anywhere. And we might be more limited in our options for how we can exercise if, you know, we're stuck at home and maybe we're used to um, going to a gym or getting out um, in a way that we can't now. So this takes a little bit more creativity and a little bit more thought um, and kind of deliberate action, putting it into your day um, if it's not naturally there already. But, um, and Dr. Zubermanian can talk a lot more from the medical perspective. About yeah, we've actually had a physical therapist on here um, as our first speaker because we knew that this was so important. And then we were going to have a sleep, uh, an occupational therapist who's really interested in sleep uh, joining us, I think, uh, next week. Yeah. And so, and then definitely from a psychological mental health perspective, every little bit makes a difference. So even if you don't have it in you to do a full structured workout, any, any kind of movement is going to be good for your mood and your energy level. So we really want to kind of think about plugging that in during the day. Um, all right, next slide. All right, the great outdoors. So um, I well, actually maybe it'd be helpful to kind of get a sense for kind of where you all are at and in terms of people's functional levels and how much, you know, from a safety perspective or just a reality physical limitations, if, are people able to get outside and walk around or are people mostly? Yeah, really I think it's a mix. Some people are very active on here and some people are a little bit more homebound. Um, so it's a real mix of patients and their caregivers as well. Okay. So, I mean, so if you can physically get outside, if you have access to places in nature, then you're very fortunate and we want to take advantage of every opportunity we have. Um, I know my saving grace these last two weeks has been that I, I live near a trail. Um, it's like a hiker biker trail and there's a creek and trees and it's beautiful and it's, uh, it does so much for our peace of mind. And so that is one of the best things you can do for your mood, um, for your stress levels, if you can. Um, so ideally, if you have a, a lovely hiking trail to go to, that would be wonderful. And not everyone can do that. Not everyone lives nearby. Not everyone's physically able or feels comfortable from a, a safety perspective getting out. So, you know, we want to, for any of these recommendations, really, we want to break it down into the smallest achievable step. So maybe you can't go on a hike, but you can, you can at least sit on your porch and you can get some fresh air that way. Or maybe you can do like a little walk down the block, um, or maybe you can just open the windows, or maybe you have plants that um, you have in your, um, in your home, you're going to take care of. Uh, or like a little home garden, or even just opening. I mean, um, the very least we can do is at least try to maybe look at uh, sounds or pictures of nature. But um, but the more we can do um, on that front, then then the better off we're going to be from a mental health perspective. Um, productivity. So this is something where it's just so fundamental to what we need as human beings. We need to feel that uh, our lives have purpose, that we, that we do something with our time here on earth. And we want to feel useful and we want to feel like each day is different from the day before because we've done something to make it different. Um, and so we, we need to find ways to fill our day that give us that sense of accomplishment. And here we're trying to strike a balance because we, on the one hand, we want to be productive. We want to get things done. On the other hand, it's Sometimes we kind of set ourselves up with a to-do list and we think we want to get, we, we do want to get all those things done. We think we can do it and then we can't. And then we just feel bad about ourselves and then we just get discouraged and stuck. And it's, it's like, why even try? Because I'm not going to tackle this whole overwhelming list. So 
Um, we just want to be really careful about expectations management with how much you can get done in a day. Um, and you can see the little cartoon at the bottom. So if your mindset is, okay, I organized my junk drawer, <laughs> and then you've got that sense of accomplishment, that's great. But if your standard is, okay, well, I'm going to organize the whole house, and all I got done was one drawer, now I feel really bad about myself. So um, we just want to celebrate every small win and every like physical activity, every you know, thing you can get done is great. And if you can't get it all done, that's okay. We're striking some kind of middle ground. Um, the next thing is, is finding something joyful. And you know, these, are, these are dark times we're living in, but uh, there's also a lot of room still for doing things we enjoy and having fun and finding humor, you know, even if it's dark humor in the middle of everything. Um, but we want to be able to spend time on things that make us happy and things that we've, we've turned to in the past. Um, so I've got a bunch of examples there, uh, on the screen and, you know, sometimes it takes some creativity adapting whatever our hobbies or interests are, um, for our new social distanced lifestyle. But, um, but there's always something we can find to enjoy. Um, all right. And then this is a really big one here. And this is part of the rub that's so hard right now is that we need, um, in times of stress, we really need to connect. And that's a very primal instinct that I'll actually get to in the next slide after this. But now at this stressful time that we need that connection, it's, it's actually really hard to get it. Um, and we can't, we can't do to be together the way we have been in the past and the way we want to be. So uh, we're just trying to be really um, creative and thoughtful about the ways we can create um, social connection in our day-to-day -day lives, even if it's not what we want and it's not what we're used to, um, but we have to kind of use what we can get. Um, so to go ahead to the next slide and talk a little bit more about that tend and befriend instinct. So um, maybe show of hands, has anybody heard of the uh, fight or flight response. Um, so the fight or flight response is, it's a reaction that's really hardwired into all of us to, um, to respond to an immediate threat. So when, you know, in, in thinking about it in kind of caveman um, terms, there, if you had a saber tooth tiger, let's say chasing after you, then you need this kind of instinctive protective response to be able to run away or fight it off. And so that's where we get this physical reaction where we, um, our blood starts pumping, our heart is pounding, our blood pressure is going up, our, our body is directing blood to our arms and our legs and we're gonna run away or fight off that threat. And so that's, you know, that's where we get that anxiety response. All those symptoms that you feel when you're feeling anxious, that's your fight or flight response. So, um, I just lost the, um, just later I lost the slide view, but um, there we go. Okay, so um, so that's our fight or flight response. It's one response to stress, but, but we have this other response to stress too, which is um, when we're under some kind of threat, we have this urge to to hunker down and be together with the people that we care about. And so this um, this response is uh, it was first kind of discovered or talked about in the literature in the late 90s. So that's a much newer concept than the fight or flight response, which we've been talking about for nearly a century. Um, but it's that tendency when we're, when we're feeling stressed and threatened that we want to be able to be together with people. We want to be able to support each other. It brings us close together. It makes us want to cooperate. We need to trust each other because we can't um, protect ourselves from a threat alone. And I, I feel like this, the current situation has certainly uh, really reinforced that and just kind of shown how interdependent we are and how we really all need each other in these invisible ways we never even paid attention to before. Um, so we take that piece of this very, very seriously and want to do everything we can to stay um, socially connected. Um, so we can go to the next slide. And then this is something that Dr. Subramanian and I were talking about is that we know how wonderful social connection is, but it's not actually so accessible for everybody right now. Um, maybe you want to comment more on that, um, kind of the limitations folks have. Yeah, so um, so just to sort of just comment a couple, on one or two of the slides that you just had had before. So speaking about nature, um, there's actually been some studies, I think just generally in 
in the integrative medicine literature about getting out in nature that there's actually chemicals that are released from plants that are good for us as humans um, that is helpful to our well-being. And so, like you said, the sort of, even if you can't get out in, they, they talk about forest bathing and gardening and things like that, um, which would definitely be things that people can still possibly do. Um, but even if you have a, a home plant or some people are buying little gardens for their windowsill just to tend to, sometimes that sort of soil, um, some of the chemicals in the soil, some of the chemicals in plants are actually very helpful for us as humans. The other thing I will say is about the sunlight, that can also help with the circadian rhythm and, and um, natural sunlight is probably a lot better for starting the day and um, getting that rhythm going than the, um, the sort of artificial lights that many of us are around when we're looking on screens or in, indoors. And so if you can get to a window with the sunlight, that's definitely a good thing. Um, yeah, so we were talking about this, um, social isolation and so much of what we've told people is to get in groups and um, I think we've spoken about this before on some of these chats. Um, there's been a real interest in um, what social isolation does in terms of um, as a as a prognostic indicator or, or how well you do as you age um, in, in normal aging. And what some people have found actually in, in literature is that being socially isolated or being lonely is worse for you than if you're smoking on a regular basis. And so this is a real risk factor for disease, um, heart disease, depression, many things like that. And um, Lori Mishley and I have looked at um, a cohort of Parkinson's patients and seen that um, that's the case in our patient populations too, that people seem to do worse if they're socially isolated or if they're lonely than if they're connected. And so that's why we spend so much time trying to get our patients off the couch and into group exercises and all these different sort of support groups that are live have been really helpful for our patients. And we really like even as doctors to socially connect with you when you come see us in the office. And so I think that people are going through that withdrawal from those sorts of things and so I was speaking to um, Dr. Moskowitz today about um, some of her thoughts even in helping people who are less fortunate even than us um, and don't have even technology or ways to reach out or connect through the internet. Um, and I think you were saying that you had seen um, some videos around people who've actually been in um, isolation, um, forced isolation in, in prison situations and other adversity. And so you were going to speak a little bit to that, I think, today. Yeah, exactly. That's where we're, we're going right now. Um, because, you know, a lot of the conversation we've had about social connection, all the things you can do with your family, things you can do on Zoom and WhatsApp and, and all that. Um, but at the end of the day, well, everyone, I guess everybody who's made it here is uh, tech savvy enough to have to be able to participate with this. Um, but some people live alone and, and some people can't get the, like, really can't get the physical social contact that, um, that you would have if you're, you know, um, living in, at home with a family of a bunch of people who are all in each other's business. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the difference between physical social isolation and the feeling of loneliness. Um, because certainly when you're physically al alone, you're going to have a much higher risk of feeling lonely, but it's not exactly a one-to-one. -one. It doesn't exactly determine it because you can be physically alone and be very happy. You can be physically alone and be just reveling in the joy of solitude. Um, or you could be physically surrounded by a lot of people and actually feel emotionally very lonely. So if we can separate out those two things and recognize that one doesn't guarantee the other, then even if we're physically isolated, there's things that we can do for our emotional state. Um, that are still helpful. And so going back to that initial slide about problem-focused coping versus emotion-focused coping, you know, there's a lot that, that we can do to kind of try solve the problem of social isolation, you know, with online groups and, um, you know, talking to people from the driveway or whatnot, um, but there's a limit to what those things can do. And so this is really about coping with the, the emotion, um, the emotional aspect of social isolation. So if we go to the next slide, um, so, um, Yes, that just basically summarizes um, that point. And if we focus on our emotions, we can get through this. So there's two um, prominent former political prisoners who uh, released recently released just short five minute videos that I think are really powerful to watch. Um, Jason Resign is a journalist who is imprisoned for about a year and a half, um, maybe closer to two years in Iran. And he, uh, he wrote a piece in the Washington Post yesterday or the day before recently 
um, and released a, a five minute video about the lessons learned from his experience being in solitary confinement. He said a lot of people have been reaching out to him, you know, what did, what did he learn about surviving that ordeal? And he was in an eight by eight prison cell um, alone. So if we, as bad as our individual circumstances are, if we're in, you know, in a better condition than an eight by eight prison cell, then you know, we, have, we have what to be grateful for. So the, here's the five things that he suggested. His first one was don't spend all of your time online, which is maybe ironic uh, coming in the middle of a Zoom group. But this is the, kind of the catch 22 that we're in. Like this is, being online is our portal to the world and it's a tremendous opportunity. And if this pandemic had hit 15 years ago, we would not have all of the ways of staying connected that we have now. So we're very, very lucky in that sense. But on the other hand, everything in moderation. Because if we're constantly online and we're constantly on social media or we're you know, hitting refresh on CNN or on the Johns Hopkins you know, epidemiological stats about how many, how many deaths uh, how many deaths in the pandemic, it's, it can just really build and build and build our anxiety. Um, and there's actually a lot of literature also uh, correlating loneliness and um, time online and time in social media. Um, so he, he talked about how, I mean, when he was in um, isolation, he did not have the internet, um, but, and he, he craved information, but at the same time that he, he could appreciate that it, it actually was in some ways helpful not to have that distraction and it, it really helped him to focus to learn how to focus in a way that he couldn't before um and so we just want to be very careful about you know budgeting our screen time um and making sure that we're also using this opportunity to do things um that are offline that are kind of in the real world even if we're living in a smaller real world than we would like to in our own houses um do you want to do you want to hop in with anything no, on that? I, no, I think that's very reasonable. I think a lot of our patients are sort of worried and constantly reading and and on the uh, like reading news on their phones or um, getting updates uh, from or texts even from people. And I think that you know supporting all these different people uh, with just the the news that's coming out, the barrage of news, it just gets very overwhelming. And so I think that yes. Um, not only us spending all our time online, but telling others around us to probably try to back off on that as well, because um, it doesn't, it's not very helpful in some ways to get um, hourly updates from not only ourselves, but everybody else who's watching it. It's just sort of this overload. Right, exactly. So um, a good counterpart to that is to read books. And he said that he, well, when he was in prison, he was actually able to uh, to read books, and he talked about how important that was for him. And that at that time, he he actually he found himself especially drawn to books about people uh, going through dealing with adversity. And um, there's no shortage of books out there, stories of individual struggle and in really horrendous circumstances. But um, he talked about how that really gave him some of the strength and perspective to kind of look at his own ordeal, look at what other people have survived um, and uh, gave him kind of the, the sense that he could, he could continue and he could carry on and that he, he wasn't alone in his suffering too. So um, stories of adversity can be helpful in that way. They can also be really depressing and maybe we need an escapist outlet. So uh, nothing wrong with, you know, junky romance fiction or <laughs> anything that I mean, novels are great because they get us out of our world and into somebody else's world. And they, um, when I was a kid, my dad once said to me, he said, if you always have a book with you, you will never be bored and you will never be lonely. And um, it's, you know, <laughs> wise words, especially now. So, um, so definitely look at what you have lying around at home on your bookshelves. Um, the third I think even like the feel of real books and the paper and there's something very calming about that that is not reproducible for me um, with you know a Kindle or or reading on my phone for some reason. I think yeah. maybe it's the light or something like that. But yeah, it's it's the physicality of it. It's being able to kind of see things on the page and to flip through. And yeah, I tried to Kindle for all of two weeks and I was like, this is not satisfying. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> big fan of physical books. Um, exercise we talked about and, and, you know, again, kind of putting things in perspective, he was an eight by eight cell. And he said he, what he did is he just, he walked from one side of the cell to the other eight by eight. It's not very big. Um, but just being in, in motion that, that very basic movement, 
um, he talked about being extremely important for him. Um, so again, if he could do it in eight by eight cell, we can all do it in our homes. Um, the fourth thing he said was planning for the future and, and remembering that as bad as this is, it's not going to last forever. And we don't know when it will end or how it will end um, or what things will kind of look like on the other side, but there will be another side at some point. And so being able to anticipate that, being able to plan for it um, can really help kind of protect us from despair and helplessness. Um, and uh, we all do better when we have something to look forward to in our lives. So maybe that's a big trip. Um, maybe that's a, real, a great restaurant you love to go to. Maybe that's um, a friend you want to be able to see physically and give a hug to. Um, just thinking about the, the life that you will have after this to propel you forward. And the last thing was to laugh, to, to find humor even in, um, again, even in the most desperate situations. He said that he kind of made mental notes about the things that his uh, prison guards did that he found humorous and kind of took some, some solace in that. Um, so I've got, I've got another set of um, five. This is from Natan Sharansky. So he spent nine years in a Soviet gulag and nearly half of that uh, was in solitary confinement. Um, it's pretty hard to imagine four and a half years uh, alone, but he managed to do it and come out the other end. And he has a, a very charming five minute video um, also with his five um, tips. And uh, some of these are a little bit more, um, more about your mental state and less about concrete actions. But the first thing he said is to remember why you're in quarantine and that there's a purpose to this. And it's because we are all collectively responsible, not only for our own safety, for the safety of our loved ones, for the safety of our healthcare professionals who are on the front lines, for the safety of everybody. And so um, what, what we're doing now matters and it affects many more people than we can even imagine. Um, and in, in order for this pandemic to, for the damage to be contained, it's gonna require the cooperation of all of us as a whole. And so if we can kind of keep that in mind and remember why we're doing what we're doing, it not only gives us a sense of purpose, but it also puts us as part of the, the greater good. And so maybe even, even if we're physically isolated, we are in that sense emotionally connected to all of the people that we have responsibility for, we can't even see. Um, the second thing he said is to make plans that are under your control. And it's interesting, here's where he differs a little bit from Jason Resign, who said, okay, make plans for the future after this ordeal is over. Natan Sharansky said, make plans for, for what you can actually do now. Because since you don't know when this is over, making plans for a future time that's not in your control or determination could maybe set you up for a sense of disappointment or helplessness too. So he says, make plans for what you're gonna use this time for. Are you gonna, is there a book that you've been wanting to read that you've been putting off? Is there a language that you wanna learn that you can now have the opportunity to learn from home? Um, is there a national park that you've never gotten to visit in your life? And maybe you're physically not in a position to be able to ever go there, but now the national parks are, um, you can visit them online and get tours that way. So thinking about what you can do and planning for it, putting it on your calendar and making sure it happens um, is something that can move you forward and give you something to look forward to. Um, and I think we were speaking earlier, um, Dr. Subramanian, about how that can be, it can be hard, um, especially with, uh, with Parkinson's to kind of get yourself to do things um, even that you wanna do. Yeah, with the apathy and stuff like that, it's been even before this, sometimes hard to get people motivated. But I think again, sticking to that schedule, like you mentioned in the, the wake sleep cycle schedule and the eating schedule, and these things are all ways to fit these things in. And you can even possibly, you know, um, plan some of these things a little bit, you know, watching your favorite show from maybe your childhood. Some of these things are all available on Netflix or whatever. And, you know, we've been finding, I love British comedy and my children and I watch that sometimes um, just sort of because it's comforting and it's funny and, you know, share, share some laughs and, you know, maybe make some time to do some things that are, you know, a little bit uh, in the hobbies range or in, in sort of um, learning new things or whatever. So I, I, I totally agree. Yeah. And, and going along with the plans piece, you know, when you put things on your calendar, that forces you to look 
more than a day ahead. Um, and we talked before about setting up a routine for your days, but we also want to think a little bit, um, a little bit bigger in terms of setting a routine for your weeks or for your month. Um, because if every day is like more or less like the day before, then um, that that robs us of something. Like we we really thrive when we have um, not just the structure for our day, but the structure for our week, our month, our year. It's it's the rituals, it's holidays, it's you know. On on Wednesday, my daughter had Taekwondo when she was in school, and so yesterday it was well, yesterday was Thursday. We missed Wednesday. We got busy with other things, but we're like, okay, we're going to do Taekwondo. We're going to find a video and try to recreate that sense of the weekly structure. Like Friday nights, we have, um, we celebrate the Sabbath. We have chicken soup and challah. And that makes Friday nights feel, especially now, feel different than all the other nights of the week. Um, and so if you can kind of plan things in your week that way ahead, you, um, you have things to look forward to and you have uh, more of that um, kind of that rhythm of your week that, um, that we really do best with. Um, number three, humor. So that's universal advice from people who've been there. You have to find the humor. And he also, um, his example also was having to do with the guards. He said that he used to make anti-Soviet jokes to his guards. And um, that, that reminded me of um, something I'd, I'd read before about how humor is inherently social. It's very hard to just kind of laugh at something out of the blue without any social context. So if we're laughing alone, it's often because of some kind of social cues to like maybe a funny text message that somebody sends to us or a funny show or movie that we're watching. And those are, you know, people on the screen doing that funny thing. And so that experience of laughter, of humor is is really a social experience, even if there's nobody physically in the room with us. So that's something else that can really make us feel connected. Um, the fourth thing is hobbies. He's a, a big chess player. And he said that he, during his time in isolation, he, he played so much chess and knew um, the game so well that he played thousands of chess games in his head. So he didn't have a physical chess board, but he could, he could envision and play out the entire game of chess, which, blows my mind. I can't even fathom how <laughs> one's brain could function that way. Wow. Um, but that kept him going. And that was something he loved and something he kept. So Natan Sharansky could find a way to play thousands of chess games in his head in <laughs> four years of, four and a half years of solitary. Um, we can think about what are the things that we like, that we find engaging and enjoyable. You know, if it's knitting, if it's singing, um, if it's gardening and kind of keep keep those things up. And then the fifth thing he said is to, to feel your connection and think of um, putting yourself in the context of all the people who came before you and all the people who right now are experiencing the same, um, the same struggle and just remembering that you're not alone. And this is a, a, a theme I've been really hitting on with the patients that I see um, this week because everybody's struggling in their own, you know, whether it's someone who's immunocompromised and is very anxious about that, or it's parents who are trying to work and take care of their kids who are now, now not in school, um, or um, people who are concerned about their um, elderly parents that they can't visit anymore. Um, these are these are struggles that are shared across the population now. And so as as bad as the struggles are, if, if there's somebody else who shares it with us and we keep that in mind, then it, it lifts the burden just a little bit. Um, anything that you'd... No, I think, I mean, I think this is sort of emphasizing the universal con connectedness that we all have of not just here, but to people all over the world and sort of um, getting messages out to everyone that we care about. And, you know, our street has this um, whole phone connection and people who aren't on text, we have some older people living on our street, we have their phone numbers and trying to just check in with each other. I think we had mentioned these phone trees um, on this uh, chat um, earlier this week as well. So I think all of these things are, are very, very reasonable and very interesting and, and inspiring that people have gotten through nine years. So hopefully we can, you know, stick in there right now. <laughs> right. We have, we have a lot more in our houses than, um, than they had in their cells. So, um, so the last piece is about anxiety. And before we talk about managing anxiety, just wanted to um, do some definitions first and um, kind of explain a little bit what that is. So anxiety is, is our response when we're, we're 
uh, anticipating or experiencing some kind of threat. And so, like I mentioned, the fight or flight response before that, you know, that evolved way back in the day when we we're facing threats from, you know, the saber tooth tiger or the rival tribe that's, you know, coming after us with their stones and spears. Um, yeah, but it's the same anxiety response that is is kicked off now when our brains detect a threat, even if it's not a physical immediate threat, even if it's like kind of vague, like a virus that's out there. Um, and we, we know that anxiety is worse when we don't have a sense of predictability and we don't have a sense of control. And so you, know, you look at the current situation and that is exactly where we're at. We can't predict what's going to happen. We have no control over ultimately what kind of um, what kind of havoc it's going to wreak. You know, we can only do our little part that social distancing feels like you can't even see the results of what you're doing. So it doesn't feel like you have very much control. Um, and so when we're experiencing anxiety, there's a whole lot of ways we experience it. Some of it's physical and that's that fight or flight response. So heart pounding, blood pressure up, sweats, dizziness, headache, um, feeling kind of shaky, fatigue. Um, because you've got that rush of, of blood to your um, big muscle groups, you often develop muscle tension, um, shortness of breath, insomnia. So that's, that's what your body is going through when you're anxious. And then in your mind, um, anxious thinking is usually catastrophizing, worst case scenario, what if this happens, what if that happens, um, that, that spiral that just kind of circles around and around and gets worse and worse, and all these worries that feel out of our control. Um, and then from a behavior standpoint, there's different ways that we, um, we respond to anxiety with our actions. So sometimes um, a big response we have to anxiety is to avoid. Um, we don't wanna deal with something or we wanna kind of hide from it because it feels too overwhelming. Or sometimes we're avoiding the feeling of anxiety. We don't wanna feel anxious because it's so unpleasant. So we can numb that with alcohol, we can numb that with drugs, we can do all kinds of unhealthy things to, um, to numb out our anxiety. And that's uh, where some folks are um, finding themselves engaging in risky behaviors. Um, another behavior we can use to deal with anxiety is preparing. And so um, doing the steps like, you know, stocking up at the grocery store before we were all in quarantine um, or information seeking is another thing we tend to do when we're anxious. We, we want, because we need that sense of control and we need that predictability. We wanna know what's happening next. So we're gonna seek and seek and seek information until we have our answers. Um, sometimes to our detriment because sometimes there are no answers and you can spend hours on social media looking for answers that you're never gonna get. Um, sometimes we're doing reassurance seeking. You know, when we're anxious, we wanna feel better. So we're, we're looking for somebody to tell us it's gonna be okay. Um, and we try, to, we try to do anything we can to gain control because uh, in a situation that's out of our control, that feels really bad. So we're, we're looking for something we can control. Um, and so hearing this whole description of anxiety, it's a very unpleasant feeling. Um, it, it is a feeling that people try to avoid at all costs often. And so sometimes people, when people come to see me, they say, I want to, even before this whole thing started, we're just talking about kind of garden variety anxiety. They're saying, I don't want to feel anxious anymore. That's my goal. <laughs> I want you to help me get rid of my anxiety. Um, and I say, I can't actually do that because uh, if we go to the next slide, um, we can see that you actually need some anxiety. This is this curve. So it's the shape of that whole um, epidemiological curve you've seen in the news. Um, but it's not that, it's all different. So the, the bottom axis is your anxiety level. So on the, uh, on the left side, that's low anxiety. The middle is moderate and the right side is high anxiety. And then the other axis, the vertical axis is your level of functioning. So if you're at the bottom, that's low functioning, you're not doing so well. If you're at the top, that's high functioning, you're doing great. Um, and so if we go to the next, uh, the next one, um, and I'll say I, I made this set right before, it was, it was Friday, March 13th. So it was right the day after uh, Maryland. So I live in Maryland. So our schools closed the night before and it was just kind of hitting us here um, in our state that, okay, this is, this is a real thing. This is serious and this is gonna change our lives right now. Um, but at the time there are, I mean, and still there are people who are like, ah, this is fake news. Um, this is not a big deal. You know, people are still going out or like spring break on the beach. And so being in that too low zone of anxiety is not actually a good thing because when you don't 
feel any kind of anxiety, you have no motivation to, to deal with it, to deal with the threat, the problem. So you're going to do things that are reckless. You're going to do things that are unnecessarily risky. Um, you're going to ignore the warning signs. And so we actually don't want to be very low anxiety when there's a real problem going on. Um, but if you go to the next slide, um, we don't want to be too high in our anxiety either because when we're so anxious and we're feeling so flooded with all those physical symptoms and our mind is just spinning, 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 um, we can't actually be effective in dealing with problems. So we're just kind of paralyzed, we're panicking, we're just kind of caught up in all of these what ifs and spiraling thoughts. Um, we get obsessive. And so, and then we, you know, sometimes we share that with everybody else and then they freak out and then they're really anxious and then nobody's doing well. So we really have to try to rein that in and get us back to a middle ground. And so that middle ground, next slide, um, that, that just right zone of anxiety is where we're just anxious enough that we're motivated, we're, we, we're energized, we have that buzz of, okay, this is a problem, we're gonna deal with it. Um, we can think clearly. And, um, and we're focused on what needs to be done. So that's that optimal um, range. We're, we're motivated, but we're not panicking. And so just to, um, the, the next one after this is just a summary um, of that, those three zones. So we don't wanna be too low. Being in denial is gonna put us in danger. We don't wanna be too high because um, being panicky is gonna paralyze us. We wanna be just in the middle where we can kind of focus on what needs to be done. Um, we can focus on what is in our control um, and kind of circling back, you know, to the extent that we can do problem focused coping. That's great. To the extent that we can, you know, increase our safety and protect our loved ones, do what needs to be done. That's um, we're, we're all over that. But there's also a lot that we can't control. So most of what I mean, if the, the takeaway I want you all to get from this today is um, to think about the, the ways you can take care of yourself to keep you in that green zone. So um, just to, to summarize, the final slide just kind of brings, uh, brings it back to some of our very basic um, points here. So this is what we need right now. We need a good sleep schedule. We need physical activity. We need good nutrition. We need a basic routine framework plans in our day. Not too much, but just enough to kind of structure us. We need something to do. We need something to enjoy, preferably that we can laugh at. And we need social connection. So that is, um, that is what uh, I've got here for you. We can I'll pass perfect. it over to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me see if there's any... So I don't know if people have questions, we can have them um, added in the chat. But um, so I know that we've talked a little bit about the sort of rumination concept and, and sort of thinking about the same thing over and over. Um, I think even outside of this sort of situation, some of our patients with Parkinson's have, you know, um, it's quite common, the types of things that we have um, that are common in our patients are um, anxiety, sometimes an anxious depression anyways. And so um, it becomes um, sometimes hard to not ruminate, which means thinking about the same thought over and over. One of the things that I tell my patients, um, having done a little bit of study around um, meditation and mindfulness is that, um, that sometimes when, we're, when we have these thoughts that come in and you're keeping track of the thoughts, it tends to be the same thought over and over and over. And I think that's all the more heightened at this time with this whole virus situation. And so um, when you think those thoughts, th what happens in the brain is that um, you end up sort of, you, th those centers that think about those thoughts get almost like a kindling. They go, the thought, the brain goes right to that and starts to sit there and think more and more and more about that same thought. And then you end up spending a lot of time and energy on that and it becomes hard to focus on these other things. And so I think, the sort of framework of keeping busy, kind of distracting yourself with ways to connect outside of chats about this issue. So if you are calling people, you know, you can check in and see how they're doing, but then maybe talk about other things, you know, um, find um, other topics to talk about. Because I think if we're all spending all day, every day, night and day, talking and ruminating about this, it becomes very hard to get 
it's, it is that para paralysis is really, you know, sets in and then um, even the things that we're supposed to be doing, um, being productive, even with a Parkinson's patient's day. So taking our pills on time, taking, you know, um, a walk, doing the exercise, doing the things that we all know we're supposed to be doing to stay healthy becomes harder to do. And I've talked to some of our patients and they get sort of um, distracted and, you know, day becomes night. And um, even some of my own family members, it's like, you know, very hard to get anything done when you have no framework to organize it around and you're just thinking about this stuff and then not focusing and getting things done. So it makes, you know, efficiency of, of getting anything done actually quite poor. So I would reiterate sort of trying to do those things that were on that slide. And maybe we can post some of these slides at the end of this. We'll also try to post the videos, the two videos of the, um, the people who were in that uh, confinement situation and any other resources that you might have um, as well. Um, and then, you know, uh, I would, again, reemphasize some, some of these um, possible mind-body strategies. So um, things like breath work, uh, meditation, um, yoga that in, in, can include, or Tai Chi and things like that, that really kind of slow down the mind, get you from thinking the same thoughts over and over, and maybe sort of thinking about things um, a little bit differently can be quite helpful to break out of that rumination cycle. So and, uh, to respond to a, a comment that um, Santia posted, um, everything being temporary, that um, it's a really good point. And um, often when we're in kind of an in anxious or depressive state, our thinking gets kind of biased and stuck in certain patterns. And so one, um, one pattern we can get stuck in is that we feel like the, the, um, the problem's gonna be there forever. We also get stuck in the pattern that everything is bad. And so everything, all the problems become, they're kind of global, it's everything and they're fixed. They're not changeable. And so um, one really important kind of cognitive tool with you know, managing your thinking, and this definitely goes um, very much hand in hand with mindfulness, is that if we can kind of step back from our thoughts and be a little bit more flexible about them um, and recognize that that's, you know, it's not, it's not always gonna be the case. This is gonna change eventually. Um, not everything is bad right now. There's a lot of things to be grateful for. We can, if we can kind of be a little bit more flexible in our thinking, then that also can help us um, break out of that, uh, those very stuck thoughts that you're talking about. Yes, and, and I think sometimes just trying to find the silver linings a little bit. I don't know if you've noticed any silver linings of the situation. Maybe you could speak to one or two if you have them. Oh my gosh, absolutely. I mean, um, one silver lining I definitely feel is I, I'm getting way more time outside than I ever have before. It's always, um, and I've got, I've got three kids age eight and under at home. So um, it, things are always crazy and busy and it's, you know, get back to work and pick up the kids and get home and get everything, you know, go, go, go. And so I feel like now because we're, we're out of our normal schedules, um, we have more flexibility. We have all this opportunity to be outside every day. Um, and that's so good for everybody. Um, and um, I, I notice my kids getting much, much closer together. And I'm seeing this with a lot of folks also, um, you know, my friends and colleagues and patients talking about the opportunity this, this gives to, um, to connect with, you know, your partner or um, for people who are living with, um, with children at home to like, be close with your family. Um, and, and I think one of the biggest silver linings I feel, um, and definitely in the patients that I work with who have, are so used to being alone in their struggles and feeling like I have this anxiety, I have this depression, no one understands it. Um, it, it it's a very lonely feeling that um, there's something about this you know, global situation we're in where everybody gets it and everybody, I feel like I see a lot of people being very, much more patient with each other, much more kind and compassionate. I mean, you see the opposite too. You see people being selfish and people hoarding toilet paper and, and all of that. But, but there's a lot of real good in humanity um, that you know, when, you're, when we're in a crisis, it kind of focuses us that way. And it makes us think about what's really important. That's great. Uh, there's one, one or two comments. Um, so people have said, um, and I, I think again, it, it's around this group um, that there's, um, one, one is that when, when I go to the grocery store, I come home feeling so unsafe and exposed. How can I shift my thinking and not react emotionally in this situation? Um, 
That, you know, that's interesting. That was, I just did this um, webinar at my, um, my practice and that was actually the last question that we had at the end of our hour there. Um, so that it's, it's, it's really hard. And I think um, there was a video posted recently. I haven't actually watched it yet, but I've had a lot of people reference it. So I'm going to go watch it after this is over um, about like a doctor laying out kind of comparing like a surgical field. Um, like when you're preparing for surgery, you have like the sterile side and the not the non-sterile side and kind of treating your kitchen that way when you're bringing in groceries. Um, and that there's so much anxiety about, you know, What's, what contamination are you bringing home from the grocery store? Um, I can't talk from a medical perspective, <laughs> leave that to you about you know, what, what you should actually do, what's the correct way. But in terms of dealing with the anxiety of that, I bring it back to you know, what is in your control and what is not in your control. Um, I know I personally do not have the wherewithal to wipe down and sterilize and do whatever for every single piece of groceries that we bring into the house. Um, and just, I mean, there's three kids running around and we're all just trying to get through the day. So, you know, so that's, that's what I use for myself. And that's what I recommend for other people too, is think about what you can realistically do. Um, yeah, because, I think you can take it all to an extreme and be so paralyzed from fear that you don't eat anything or don't go out and buy the things you need. So I think there's a balance between you know, the, the, the basic things, like if you're above 60, 65, stay home, you know, let other people do your shopping for you if you can, try not to expose yourself unnecessarily to things that are, um, you know, elective, but, you know, and follow the law and the rules. But I think, you know, trying to go crazy with every little item that you're bringing in the door and thinking that people are, are somehow out there that are all infected, that are waiting outside your door to pounce on you or at the grocery store is, is, is very paralyzing. And I think that we all have to ultimately live in. Undue stress is also very stressful in the end um, to disease as well. And so the anxiety and stress can be so so detrimental so i think we have to find ways to balance um there's another uh comment here i'm a caregiver and my person with parkinson's is in the too low anxiety zone and i have to do all the worrying for both of us what can i do that that's something i'm hearing from a lot of my um my patients too and i think a lot of it comes down to okay well what is the consequence that you're seeing you know if the consequence is that they are um hopping on a plane to i don't know to florida to be on the beach with all the spring breakers or um they're gonna go run around times square um that you know th there's things you can do that are, are reckless right now right that are very very bad ideas um some people are not very anxious, but they're also not really doing anything risky. You know, you're at home anyway, and it's like, oh, okay, we're going to wait this thing out. It's not a big deal. Um, there's not anything to be gained by anxiety that's um, not actually propelling you forward. Um, so I don't know if that's, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so there was a comment here. Um, we just have a minute. Um, Elaine Book had written, who I am typing as I speak to you about her coming on this. She's a, um, um, up in Vancouver. I want her as a guest too, because um, she gives such great comments. Um, maybe there's something to be said uh, for acknowledging that you're not okay at times during the day, giving yourself permission to feel sad or angry or frustrated, and then use some of those strategies to move on. Designate a worry time or sad time in the day and then put it away and know you can come back to it and again another time. Uh, yeah. I think that that's very reasonable. And we've talked, we talk about that in other situations when people are worried. Um, so I think finding, you know, kind of like a something like a box that you take off the shelf and you can give that sort of put it in that box and then put it back on the shelf um, and, and go about your, your business, your day. So uh, very and, yeah, I would add to that, that um, again, what makes this time different from, from, you know, normal times for people who struggle with depression or anxiety is that, when you're the only one um, feeling that way, it, it feels like wrong to feel that way. Okay, I shouldn't feel anxious. I shouldn't feel depressed. What's wrong with me for feeling that way? We kind of deny our emotions and we stuff it away. Um, but we are living in a very unique moment where all of us are not okay sometimes. We are all anxious sometimes. We are all sad sometimes. We're all grieving the loss of the activities and the, the normal things that made up our lives before. We're all very frustrated with the things that we can't do. Um, and so knowing that those are universal feelings, I think makes it a lot easier to acknowledge them and allow them. And then once we can name our emotions and once we can say, okay, yeah, this is how I'm feeling. <laughs> feeling is real. That feeling is valid. Um, it's a valid response to this situation. Then, um, 
we can have that emotion and then it can pass. Yeah. And I think ultimately we're all human. So these are all human emotions and we have to understand that this is part of the human condition. So um, this is, it's, it, it normalizes things, I think, in a way that's very universal. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, it's been great to have you, Dr. Moskowitz, and so excited to have connected with you on Facebook and hopefully maybe in, we'll have you back um, uh, uh, soon. Um, and then Andrea, I will hand it off to you unless you have a final thing to say. Um, um, no, just I'm, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. It's been, it's been really wonderful to connect with, uh, with you all. So thank you. Yes. Yeah, take it away. This was great. Um, I so appreciate I'm getting to have lunch dates with all of you across the country. So I wanted to tell you about our next lunch date, Monday the 30th um, at 12 noon Pacific. And um, we're going to be talking about sleep because, right, we, it's so much harder to do all the things that, you know, you talked about when you're exhausted and your circadian rhythm is off. So Monday, we're going to talk about getting sleep, getting rest. We have a doctor of occupational therapy. I love OTs. They're so practical and pragmatic. Um, so we're going to find some ways to turn off our brains at night so we can rest our bodies. So important for people with Parkinson's and all of us. So um, tune in Monday for that. And I will put just again, so everyone has it, it's our cheat sheet of um, you know recordings of all these sessions, um, what's coming up. Um, let me paste that in the chat. Um, any resources, um, so any resources that you have to share. I think I can find those two um, articles by the, the prisoners. Um, we'll put everything on that page. So that can always be, you know, bookmark that. And then you'll be able to see what we have planned, refer back, share it with friends. Um, it's a great jumping off place. So thank you everyone for joining us. What'd you guys think? You learned something, you feel a little bit more peaceful. Let's do, okay, we have lots of thumbs ups and waves. So thank you so much, um, Dr. Moskowitz. And thank you to our, our host, Dr. Superman. And always so great to have your neurologist perspective to tune it right into Parkinson's um, and be able to take this great general information and make sure it's super relevant for you know our, our, uh, our audience out there. So that's it for today. Have a great weekend, everyone.